So it is so wonderful to be back at Town Hall and this re recently renovated Town Hall. Um, it's not a happy time to be back. It's not a happy time to be talking about the ideas of this book because the happy story my book tries to tell is a story I think now that is deeply threatened. Indeed, this book is a book I've worked on for the whole of my career as an academic. I wrote the first version before I wrote the first book I published. And in the course of the 25 years that I've been working on this, I've come to fear that by the time I published it, the happy story I was telling would no longer be true. <laughs> that the Supreme Court that I'm describing and the history that I'm trying to put together into a, an account that makes sense of the institution is a Supreme Court that I fear is changing. And indeed, it's not just the Supreme Court. If you think of the last 30 years, I fear that we've seen every major institution of the federal government fall apart. Congress in the last 30 years is an institution whose public support has dropped into the single digits. The presidency, though at a high mark, I think just four years ago today, is at a point where no one quite knows what the function of the institution is. And my fear, before I speak of the institution of the court, is that in five years, too, we will wonder what that institution has become. But the story I want to tell isn't yet dark. The story I want to tell is hopeful and edifying. It's a hopeful story about quintessentially human actors, even though we call them justices, just humans, trying to get it right. And more importantly, the idea that I want to offer to the long debate about constitutional law is about the sense of what constrains them. Not always, not always in every case, but across the arc of cases, I think there's a pattern a pattern that makes sense of the institution of this court and a pattern that makes sense of our constitution itself. I want to describe that pattern at least enough to make it clear. I want to show us where we have to go. So I want to use this past to tell us something about the future and to address a particular crisis. <clears throat> which is a crisis of our democracy, the crisis I first spoke of when I first spoke here at Town Hall in 2011. That crisis is now, that one we must solve, and I suggest in the story of our courts we can see a way that crisis might be solved. Okay, so this institution, the Supreme Court, is an institution the framers of our Constitution had no clue they were creating. They built something called a Supreme Court. It is in the Constitution. But the institution we think of today was crafted by this man, Chief Justice John Marshall. He built that institution, or better, he planted the seeds for building that institution, I think with understanding about how institutions grow. He crafted a practice, a practice that began then and continues today. And I want to say that practice is a practice of a dance between two kinds of fidelities. One is a fidelity to meaning, what words mean. And second is a fidelity to role. How an institution, like the court, 
builds the capacity or protects the capacity to articulate what words mean. Together, these two different practices define a practice, which is how we think of the court today. These two fidelities dance together. And they sometimes work against each other. In the sense that fidelity to meaning, the practice of the justices in telling us what the Constitution means across time, is subject to a constraint, the constraint of fidelity to role. To explain this, I want to start with meaning and then I'm going to transition to this idea of role. Okay, so meaning. I think we all have a sense we know what meaning is. I think we all have a sense that sometimes meaning seems simple. So in our Constitution, in the first article of our Constitution, in defining who a representative can be, the Constitution says, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years. At least one part of that clause is clear enough. 25 years today is 25 years, 225 years ago. It's simple for us to understand what this clause was to do and how to enforce it today. But other statements are not so simple. If I said to you, meet me in Cambridge while we were in Boston, it would be pretty clear what I meant. But it would be different from what I would mean if I said it while we were in London. The statement, meet me in Cambridge, embraces something of the context around it for it to have its meaning. Or, Richard Branson went to public school. Uttered in Britain means exactly the opposite of what it means when uttered in the United States because public school in Britain means private school. So this statement, too, embraces something about the context within which it's uttered. And these two clues point to a fundamental fact about how I think about this project of interpretation. That we understand meaning to depend on context and to recognize then as context changes, Meaning can change. And that if your job is to preserve meaning, fidelity to meaning, you have to keep the change rendered by context in view. So if this is a text, like the Constitution, and it's written against a certain context, we can imagine that same text against a different context. And the point is, if we think about how the context matters, that different context might yield a different reading so as to preserve the meaning across context. And the challenge that fidelity to meaning has is, how do we accommodate the change in context? Or how do we neutralize the change in context? So as to preserve the meaning from one time or one place in a different time or a different place. And I suggest the metaphor that helps us see how that's done is the metaphor of translation. What the translator does is to neutralize the effect of context, to take words written in one place against the background of one language and to render them in a different place against the background of a different language with the objective to preserve the meaning across those two contexts. And by translation here, I don't just mean the simple kind of Google translation idea where you type in words and instantly they give you the translation. Google's pretty good at this today. But I mean a deeper sense or a more general sense of the objective of fidelity to protect or preserve meaning across contexts. So here's an example that suggests this more fundamental sense. You might not recognize the cover, but here's the first instance of the King James Bible. I want to read a passage from that Bible, which will be familiar uh, 
to everyone here. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiments and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came, upon, came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came on and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own breast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. So this extraordinary man, Clarence Jordan, founder of Koinokian Farm, which became Habitat for Humanity, and his son Hamilton Jordan went on to become one of Jimmy Carter's chief aides. Clarence Jordan ran this Christian community and didn't believe that story was perfectly understandable to most people. And the most striking feature of that story in the way that it's told is the idea of the Samaritans. Because most people think Samaritans are good people. After all, it's the good Samaritan story. But in context, of course, the Samaritans weren't good people. They were thought very poorly of by the people the story was to be told to. And so Clarence Jordan thought there was a misunderstanding being produced by reading this text in its original form. So he produced something called the cotton patch versions of Luke and Acts. And this cotton patch version was to be used, to be preached, in southern, primarily white society in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So here's the same story. But the Sunday school teacher, trying to save face, asked, but uh, um, who is my neighbor? And Jesus laid into him and said, a man was going from Atlanta to Albany and some gangsters held him up. When they had robbed him of his wallet and brand new suit, they beat him up and drove off in his car, leaving him unconscious on the shoulder of the highway. And now it just so happened that a white preacher was going down the same highway when he saw the fellow, he stepped on the gas and went scooting by. Shortly afterwards, a white gospel singer came down the road, and when he saw what had happened, he too stepped on the gas. Then a black man traveling that way came upon the fellow, and what he saw moved him to tears. He stopped and bound up his wounds as best he could, drew some water from his water jug to wipe away the blood, and then laid him on the back seat. He drove into Albany and took him to the hospital and said to the nurse, you all take good care of this white man I found on the highway. Here's the only two dollars I got, but you all keep account of what he owes, and if he can't pay it, I'll settle up with you when I make payday. Now, if you had been the man held up by the gangsters, which of these three would you consider to be your neighbor? The teacher of the adult Bible class said, well, of course, the one who treated me kindly. Now, of course, Jordan's point in crafting this quote translation was to craft a text which in the context meant the same to the readers as the original text in the original context would have. He meant to preserve that meaning. 
but he crafted a different text. But a different text to make the same effect. Translation to preserve meaning, to neutralize the context. In a sense, to keep meaning alive despite the changes in context. And what I argue in this book, after spending the whole of my academic career studying this constitution, is that this is the practice of our courts. It's a practice on the left, and it's a practice on the right, regardless of politics. That the court engages in a practice to identify a meaning, an original meaning, and then translates that meaning to preserve it across time. So here's an uncontroversial example for us, not uncontroversial at the time. The case United States versus Classic needed to address the question whether Congress could regulate, quote, primaries. Article 1, as you saw, creates a Congress. Article 2, I mean, Article 1, Section 2, says that the Congress shall be composed of representatives chosen every second year by the people of the several states and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Electors, which in this context means voters. The electors are those who get to elect the legislature, so voters. That sense of elector is similar to the sense that the framers meant by presidential electors, the electors who choose the president, chosen by a method set by the legislature. But both of them are to exercise a choice. But in section four of the Constitution, the Constitution says the time, place, and manners for holding elections shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Elections. So what does election mean? And of course, the original meaning of an election was a process for selecting someone who would govern, choosing the person who would occupy an office. And if that's what election means, is a primary an election? Because of course, a primary doesn't select anybody for office. It selects the person who's allowed to run for office. And so if Congress has the power to regulate an election, but a primary is not an election, the question the court had to address in classic was whether Congress could regulate a primary. Now, in fact, the court had addressed that in the beginning of the 19th century and said, no, Congress can't regulate a primary because a primary is not an election. And that created a great problem for civil rights in America because the great innovation of the South for excluding African Americans from the right to vote was the white primary. And the white primary said, if you're a member of the Democratic Party, the only members who get to vote in the primary are white people. And so the white primary filtered candidates to make sure that the only candidates who were elected who were, the, were those who were amenable to white voters. But if Congress had no power to regulate those elections, if those primaries were not elections, as the court had held, then there was no way to remedy this problem of primaries that were racist. So Classic decided to go the other way. The court said, we may assume that the framers of the Constitution in adopting that section did not have specifically in mind the selection and elimination of candidates for Congress by the direct primary any more than they contemplated the application of the Commerce Clause to interstate telephone, telegraph, and wireless communications, which are conceitedly within it. So to decide this case, the court says we turn to the words of the Constitution read in their historical setting as revealing the purpose of its framers and in search for admissible meanings of its words which, in the circumstances of their application, will effectuate those purposes. 
So, from time immemorial, an election to public office has been in point of substance no more and no less than the expression by qualified electors of their choice of candidates. Long before the adoption of the Constitution, that form and mode had changed. And this is the key point. There is no historical warrant for supposing the framers were under the illusion that the method of effectuating the choice of the electors would never change or that if it did, the change was for that reason to be permitted to defeat the right of the people to choose representatives for Congress, which the Constitution had guaranteed. Hence, we read its words as the revelation of the great purposes for which it was intended to be achieved by the Constitution as a continuing instrument of government, this, I want to say, is a translation. The court reads the word elections to accommodate what is not technically an election because of a commitment to the fidelity, a commitment to the fidelity to the original meaning which gave Congress the power to regulate the full scope of the process for selecting representatives. That's a simple that's a uncontroversial, politically uncontroversial example. Now, it's not all politically uncontroversial. The most famous, not the most infamous, but the most famous example of translation on the right is the story of federalism in the American Constitution. So as you probably know, the framers of our Constitution presupposed in their design a certain balance in the regulatory power of our state and federal governments. They presupposed that there would be some federal regulatory power, but most of the regulation and the power to regulate would be held by the states. That was the federalist balance that they intended. But at the very beginning of the Republic, the question was, okay, how far can the federal government regulate? And the first clear case that answers that is a case called Gibbons, addressing the question of a monopoly for a steamboat on waters regulated by the federal government. And in this case, Chief Justice Marshall gives us a formula for figuring out how far the federal government's commerce power reaches. And he says the power includes the ability to regulate activities that pass between states or activities in one state that affect other states or activities that it's necessary to regulate in order to regulate either stuff that travels between states or that is in one state that affects other states. So this is the map. And the consequence of this formula in 1824 was limited federal power. But the point is, this limited federal power was limited because of the economics of the nation. We were not an economically integrated nation. So there are lots of economic activities that didn't plausibly reach across many states. But the consequence of that design is that as economic integration grows, congressional power grows. And over the 19th century, Congress regulated more and more because it said more and more was affected by economic activity that reached across the states. At first, the Supreme Court ignored that. But then it began to feel a little bit guilty that it was defeating the framers' design of a federal balance. So it corrected that imbalance through this process I call translation. It began to describe limits on Congress's power that were not in the text of the Constitution. It described those limits in the name of this founding value of federalism. It, in a sense, made up limits on Congress's power in the name of federalism. So, for example, it said Congress can only regulate directly 
direct activities, not indirect activities. Or it said Congress can only regulate commerce, but can't regulate manufacturing, even if manufacturing affects commerce. So it's basically crafting made-up limits in the name of fidelity to limit the scope of Congress's power because they believe they're committed to the balance of the framers to assure the states have unlimited power. And if that activity is justified, and let me acknowledge this is a big if because there are many who don't think federalism is a value the Constitution embeds, but if you believe it is, then it is justified through translation. That's an example of translation on the right, and it is a fundamental part of the modern Supreme Court's vision of its job in defining the scope of Congress's power. On the left, the most understandable example comes from Seattle. You might have heard of the gentleman bootlegger, Roy Olmsted who came from Seattle and ran one of the biggest rum running operations in the nation, but he was a distinctive organized crime sort. He practiced an ethical commitment to nonviolence, so people loved him up here in Seattle. But in March 1920, he was arrested, jailed. Turns out he's actually an officer in the police force. <laughs> And the whole case against Olmsted was built on a new technology called wiretapping. Basically, as Olmsted used the telephones to place the orders and fill orders for this bootlegged product, the government was listening in. Now, you remember the story of Willie Sutton. It's not true, it turns out, but let's pretend it's true for a second being asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's because that's where the money is. If you ask the FBI in 1920, why do you tap phones? They'd say, well, that's because where the evidence is. But what Olmsted said was, well, what about the Fourth Amendment that protects me against you searching without any probable cause or without any warrant? And in the case of Olmsted versus the United States, the Supreme Court had to address the question whether the Fourth Amendment reached wiretapping. Now, the Fourth Amendment talks about unreasonable searches and seizures. But when it was written, what it was imagining was trespass. A search was something you did when you trespassed on somebody's property. And the only way to search was to trespass. There were early cases that said if you just stand outside of somebody's door or window and listen to them on the other side, you're not searching. So the early precedent said the only way to search was to trespass. And as trespass was the method of violating somebody's privacy rights, that's what the Fourth Amendment was protecting against. The problem is wiretapping involves no trespassing. They didn't break into his home to connect the wire. They just connected it to the telephone pole outside of his house. And so there's no trespassing. And what the government said is, if there's no trespassing, we don't need any warrant. And the Supreme Court in Olmsted versus the United States, an opinion written by Chief Justice Taft, former President Taft, said, that's right, no violation of the Fourth Amendment because there is no trespass. And all the Fourth Amendment protects against is trespass. But in a really brilliant dissent by Louis Brandeis, Brandeis described a completely different method for interpreting the Fourth Amendment, one that he said needed to make adaptation to a changing world. And so Brandeis said, look, ask yourself what was being protected in 1791 and then tell me how to protect it today. And that change to protect the same thing is the obligation of fidelity to the framing constitution. And that change is the example of translation, which 40 years later, the Supreme Court finally embraced and made the law. This is translation two. 
It's made up limits on the government's power, which is, if justified, and you might think it's a big if, I don't, but if justified, it is justified through this process of translation. So in both cases, my claim is, there's an original value that's preserved by neutralizing the change in context, imperfectly always, but if your commitment is a commitment to fidelity, to meaning, then it's better than nothing, at least sometimes. Okay, but this translation is really difficult. This translation of what Supreme Court does is really difficult. And by difficult, I mean institutionally difficult. Because as the gap grows between the text of the Constitution and what the Supreme Court does, and as the values underlying the doctrine, whether federalism or privacy, become contested in the ordinary political space, the pressure on the Supreme Court grows, sometimes slowly, sometimes it takes a long time, but sometimes like a tsunami. I really like this gift because that's the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> so it's gonna do it again. Supreme Court is like marching forward and then sees the tsunami, it has to turn around quick and run away. Has to run away to avoid being swallowed by the resistance. So for example, again in the context of federalism. The story of restricting Congress is really dramatic and then runs against a tsunami in 1929. Because in 1929, of course, we have the Great Depression. And the Great Depression leads many people to say the federal government has to do more. And so when FDR was elected in 1932, in 1933, he tried to do more. And when he tried to do more, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. This violates federalism. Congress doesn't have all this power. It's been reserved to the states. And as people are starving and as farms are collapsing and as banks are failing, this argument by the Supreme Court seems a little bit fanciful. The Supreme Court says the nation only has limited national powers and the public says, why the hell would that be true? We have a disaster. We need a way to respond. And as Thurman Arnold wrote at the time, when institutions function adequately, as I suggest they did before 1929, the theories which support them also appear to be adequate because they are never called upon to solve practical problems. The very success of the institution prevents anyone questioning its underlying theory. But this man did question their underlying theory. FDR took it upon himself to challenge the court's restrictive interpretation of Congress's power. Both historically, he gave an extraordinary press conference where for 30 minutes he gave basically the same talk I've been giving here tonight. I mean, a really in-depth analysis of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and where it comes from. But he went beyond that. He also started attacking the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court as based on the, quote, personal economic predilections of the justices. He was calling the justices not justices, but politicians. They were behaving politically. They were just a bunch of conservatives, right-wingers, who were resisting socialism. And as he did that, and of course he was the spokesman for the most successful political party since the Republicans of 1800, the court became rendered political. The activities of the court became seen as political. And the question for the court became not just what's true, not just what does fidelity to meaning require. Instead, the question was also, what can we, the court, do? What can we continue to do in the face of this enormous pressure from the political branches. So the question they had to face was, do we stick to what we think of as the truth, or do we yield to the pressure? And in 1937, in an extraordinarily dramatic reversal, the Supreme Court yielded. Within a month, 
It had gone from seeming to the whole world as if it was digging in and insisting that it would not change. In case of Jones versus Lachlan, it reversed 90% of what it had said, limiting the scope of Congress's power. And then a couple years later in Dar Darby, it went even further. And then the next year, in the most extreme case, Wickard versus Filburn, it told this man, Farmer Filburn, that he was not allowed to grow wheat on his own farm for his own consumption because that homegrown wheat, when aggregated with other farmers like Filburn, in aggregate, affected the commerce of the nation as a whole. And so when the federal government said, you farmer can only grow this much wheat, that was within Congress's power under this extremely expansive theory of the power of Congress. Now, most constitutional law professors look at that and say, that shows the Supreme Court has said there is no limit on Congress. And it means that the justices at the time believed that there should be no limit. But the extraordinary work of one law professor, Barry Cushman, un un unearthed some memos at the time the Supreme Court was deciding this case. And it turns out the Supreme Court came very close to saying that Congress didn't have the power to limit farmer Phil Burns homegrown wheat. Came very close to saying that this is not commerce, it is not interstate commerce, and therefore it cannot be regulated under Congress's commerce power. But Justice Jackson spent the summer trying to write that opinion. And at the end of the summer, he gave up. And he wrote a memo to his clerks explaining why he had given up. And what he said in the end was, this question, trying to limit the scope of Congress's power, is not a question we can answer. As he said, in such a state, the determination of the limit, the limit on Congress, is not a matter of legal principle, but of personal opinion, not of constitutional law, but one of economic policy. And what he was saying was acting on economic policy for the justices was inappropriate even though he thought the law was unconstitutional in the sense that Congress had gone too far, he was saying the court can't say that. So the court withdrew. Now what I'm suggesting is this is a kind of fidelity too. Not fidelity to meaning, it's a different kind of fidelity. It's fidelity to role. It's fidelity to the role the court appears to the public to be playing Does the court appear to be political or judicial? And what seems like politics will determine whether it seems to be political or judicial, and what seems changes over time. What at one time might not seem like political may be rendered political, and when it's rendered political, the court then retreats to preserve its own capacity of the institution of the Supreme Court to do its work. It runs away, but runs away so it has the opportunity to fight the fight another day. Now this is, I think, the greatest of judicial craft. It is exactly what Marshall did at the very beginning of our court. It is about crafting an institution so it can grow and become powerful enough to do the work of interpreting a constitution. And so retreating is one way it expresses its role, but not just retreating. Not just to retreat from translation, but sometimes to retreat to translation. So you probably heard of this case, Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood versus Casey. This is the case decided in 1992 that did not overturn Roe versus Wade. And what was so striking about that case is that everybody thought Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned. Because president after president in the Republican Party had promised they would appoint justices who would overturn Roe versus Wade, and at least seven had joined the court who were plausibly against Roe versus Wade. And so when people added it up, many people thought it would be seven to two to overturn Roe versus Wade. 
But this became a defining feature of what it was to be a Republican appointing a justice. You were appointing a justice to overturn Roe versus Wade, which meant if you were a justice appointed by one of these presidents, you were seen to be the tool of this president. It's a cheaper way to amend the Constitution, appoint justices to do it for you. And so in an extraordinary opinion by three of the justices people thought would overturn Roe versus Wade, Justice Souter, Justice Kennedy, and Justice O'Connor, a joint opinion which is extremely rare in the Supreme Court, they sign it as three of them together, not as one justice with others joining, they refused to overturn Roe versus Wade. And explaining why they refused, they offered the clearest explanation of fidelity to role I think that we have. As she said, in the present case, our analysis to this point makes clear the terrible price would be paid for overruling. The court's power lies in its legitimacy, a product of substance and perception. Substance and perception that shows itself in the people's acceptance of the judiciary as fit to determine what the nation's law means and to declare what it demands. The court must take care to speak and act in ways that allow people to accept its decisions on the terms the court claims for them as grounded truly in principle, not as compromises with social and political pressures having no such bearing on the principal choices that the court is obligated to make. Thus, the court's legitimacy depends on making legally principal decisions under circumstances in which their principled character is sufficiently plausible to be accepted by the nation. So here the justice is saying, even if Roe was wrong originally, which I think at least two of those justices clearly believed it was, Reversing Roe, because they had been appointed to reverse Roe, would weaken the court. Because they would be seen to be just the puppets of a president rather than articulating the meaning of the Constitution. And this is an example of fidelity to Roe. They refuse to do what they think the Constitution means because they're protecting the integrity of the institution of the Supreme Court. Now, one really critical implication to this way of seeing it is they might have a continuing obligation to engage in translation of fidelity to meaning, or different, put differently, the obligation of fidelity might remain even if in a particular moment they can't do anything to advance it. We can't know now, they could be saying, because there are no legal tools and no public will that will allow us to continue our translation. But if later there are those tools or the public will will allow us, then we'll revive the practice. And so later cases do revive the practice in the context of federalism. Chief Justice Rehnquist was the most vocal and activist justice to revive these limits on Congress's power in the name of federalism. He did so in a case called National League of Cities in 1976. Nine years later, the court retreated because it didn't find a way to do it that didn't make the court seem political. 1995, the court did it again with Lopez that struck down a law that regulated guns near schools. 10 years later, the court seemed to run away again because those lines were again too hard for the court to advance. And most recently in the Obamacare case, Chief Justice Roberts articulates a very elegant and clever principle for limiting Congress's commerce power, which hasn't yet been withdrawn because the court yet hasn't had to address whether it needs to be withdrawn. But the point is, this revival of federalism is really the court crafting new ways to advance the same old objective that don't fail in the same ways that they failed before the New Deal. So if you think about the history of federalism, there's this original position which falls out of whack, and then there's translation, then there's a retreat, that's what happens after 1937, and Chief Justice Rehnquist is the beginning of the revival which is continuing to this day. 
Okay, well, think about that in the context of the most important amendments to our Constitution, the Civil War Amendments. Amendments which took us from slavery to this extraordinary image that would have been unimaginable at the time the Civil War ended, the idea of African Americans being entitled to the right to vote. 1870, the 15th Amendment is enacted, and between the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, those amendments express a constitutional commitment to change America, both legally and culturally. This wasn't just about changing the ways Congress passes laws. This is about changing the laws and also the culture that produced the laws. It's astonishing to believe they could do that through a simple amendment to the Constitution. But that's what they did, amend the Constitution with these ideals of equality built deeply into the bones of those three amendments. But beginning in the middle of the 1870s, that change begins to stall, and then the change is stopped by white terrorists across the South who use violence to block any opportunity for Reconstruction to succeed. And the great hope of Reconstruction, the most innovative experiment in the history of America, was killed by this transformation. And so between the eighth period of 1877 in 1954, when Brown versus Board of Education is decided, America practices through its courts the most embarrassing denial of the principles of equality imaginable. The court completely retreats from the founding values of those amendments. Those founding values are betrayed. It is a practice of infidelity to the meaning of those amendments. So the question is why? Why did they not enforce those amendments as they were written? And the answer I argue in this book is because of the dark side of fidelity to role. What I want to resist in understanding this period is a relatively happy story that what happened between that period is we had a bunch of evil judges and a basically good America that these judges were eager to overturn the Civil War amendments, but America, America had taken the medicine of equality and was embracing the ideals of equality. Of course, that story is false. Instead, we need to recognize that this period was a period of an evil and racist America that effectively constrained the judges so that there was nothing in effect they could do to uphold the commitments that we had made in the Civil War amendments. And that during this time, a time that the racism gets reinforced by science and uh, culture, the most the court can do is to back away from allowing these amendments to have any force without effectively overturning the meaning of these amendments. And it's quite ironically, until the most evil in the history of racism, perhaps Adolf Hitler made equality in America possible again. Because the striking fact about the fight about whether we would go to war in World War II is that many Southern racists argued we should not go to war against Germany. Because if we go to war against Germany, people are going to say, well, wait a minute, what about the racism in America's South. African Americans in African American newspapers argued against going to the war, saying we should fight our own racism before we go fight the racism against Jews in Germany. And the great fear was the hypocrisy of waging a world war against the racism of Nazi Germany would backfire on the racism in America. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. By the time the Supreme Court decides Brown versus Board of Education, the Soviet Union is spreading propaganda around the world, talking about the hypocrisy of America. They talk about democracy and freedom and equality, but then they have videos of what it was like to be an African American in the African American South. And that hypocrisy was no longer politically sustainable. So in 1954, 
In Brown versus Board of Education, the court finally articulates the reversal to embed and revive again the idea of equality, at least with respect to race. And then after 1954, it begins to translate the values of equality outside of the context of race, to include sex, so that women benefit from a 14th Amendment that doesn't mention sex, and sexual orientation that begins to assure the protection um, beyond just sex, but also for orientation as well. That's a translation after the amendment had been revived, after the Civil War's commitments finally could come back to life. So as dif different from federalism, in this story, originally there is a commitment to equality. There's an immediate retreat to that commitment. And then in 1954, there's a revival on the terms of the amendment with respect to race, and then there's a translation beyond race that we are still seeing the court practice today. Okay, so here's the lessons of this story, which I could repeat and go on. Of course, it's a 5,000-page long book, so, you know, we could go on for a long time, but repeat in many different contexts. But if you add them all together, here's the lessons in general. Constitutional law lives within constraints. Some of them are the obvious ones, the text of the Constitution. AOC cannot be president because she is not 35 years old. That, commit, that constraint is not movable without amending the Constitution. But what my book argues is in addition to that, there's a constraint of the context. And that this context is rich and deep and complicated and that we, in important ways, are that context, our beliefs our expectations, our understandings about the nature of the world, they constrain what the court can do. Sometimes they constrain to enable fidelity. Sometimes they constrain to resist fidelity. And in this sense, we, our beliefs, are a kind of constitution too. And as they change, they change what the Constitution can do, regardless of the text. They always are defined, this text, by the possible which is made possible by our beliefs and understanding in the context. So that's the general point. But the particular point, the hopeful point, the point that comes back to where I started about democracy, is how this point affects the law of democracy. Because the law of democracy is, in this sense, also about the culture of democracy. It's about how the culture of democracy gets built. And it's obvious it gets built by us, by our expectations and our practices and our demands. Now, we all know that at the federal level, the law of democracy is now hopeless. I was proud that my friend John Sarbanes convinced Nancy Pelosi to introduce H.R. 1 to deliver on her promise that if the Democrats took the House, they would deliver H.R. 1. H.R. 1 is the most ambitious reform package considered by Congress since the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It would change the way congressional campaigns are funded. It would end partisan gerrymandering. It would have automatic vote registration everywhere, restore the Voting Rights Act, and stop the revolving door of Washington politicians to K Street lobbyists. So it's great not just because it's right, but it's great because it was first, because it said, it showed the priority, it acknowledged the necessity, it said nothing else is possible in Washington before we fix this. But as H.R. 1 moved from the House side to the Senate side, the dark lord of democracy, <laughs> Declare this was just a democratic power grab. <laughs> Which would be a fine sentence if it were a small d democratic power grab, because that's what it was. It was about restoring democracy. But he saw it as a big D democratic power grab. And so this idea, which should not be partisan, none of the reform should have been partisan, was rendered partisan by McConnell and that is the way everything happens in Washington now so that nothing can get done. But the hopeful fact about this is it's not so in the states. 
In 2018, we saw the most progressive grassroots reform passed in initiatives across the country ever in the history of the United States. Even in the progressive era, they didn't pass as much as we passed in 2018. And by progressive here, I don't mean partisan. Indeed, I mean most of these movements were militantly nonpartisan. They were citizens acting as citizens to defend their democracy. So in Florida, felon disenfranchisement was a ballot measure, Amendment 4, to amend the Constitution. 65% of the voters approved that in an election where no Democrat got more than 50% of the vote, which means Republicans and independents bo uh, both joined with Democrats to demand felon reenfranchisement. Or in Maine, ranked choice voting in Maine, passed by 65% in, um, um, in, in the referendum, where the biggest Democratic victory in that state was just 51%. Or in Michigan, the anti-gerrymandering initiative passed with 61% when the biggest Democratic victory in that state was just 53%. All of those are cases where the reform is being supported by Republicans and independents and Democrats alike because it's being framed, not in a partisan way, but in a citizenship way. And of course, this builds on state reforms that have been happening for the last decade. And of course, my favorite in this story is the reform that happened here in Seattle. In 2011, when I spoke in this place, a little bit more shabby version of this space than it is now, but when I spoke in this place, I was talking about my then book, Republic Lost. And in that book, I talked about vouchers to help fund elections so that candidates could depend on the people to fund their elections rather than the rich donors who they spent 30 to 70% of their time sucking up to. But when I gave this talk here, I learned very quickly it was old news here in Seattle because already there was a movement to try to get to Seattle to adopt democracy vouchers to help fund city elections, which of course in 2015 it did. And the first run in 2017 radically shifted the kinds of funding. So before the change, 48% of funders were small dollar funders. After the change, 87% were. It tripled the number of contributors to city elect, uh, elections, and it radically increased the diversity of donors. Women and minorities and younger voters were donors, not just rich white men. And this idea, so successful in 2017, and I hear from those who are looking at the numbers, 2019 is going to be even better, has affected the 2020 election for president. Andrew Yang has talked about a $100 voucher that every voter would get. Kirsten Gillibrand has talked about up to $600 that every voter would get, $200 for every federal election. So if you just have Congress, you get $200. If you have Congress and Senate, you get $400. Congress, Senate, the President, $600. And she justifies, as Andrew Yang justifies, this change on Seattle's experience. It's because of Seattle. It's because of Seattle that the imagination of American de Democrats around the country has expanded. And that begins to change the constitution of this fight for democracy as well. Now we must build this context of reform everywhere. A constitutional context demanding democracy as the natural expression of citizens inside this democracy, not as Republicans and not as Democrats, but as citizens first. What I've learned after 25 years studying our Constitution is that that is all that ever matters. You could call this a kind of populist constitutionalism, acknowledging that's not always been great. It's often been really awful as it essentially embedded racism, but here, our only hope, I think, is this expression of democracy through a popular will that begins to define what the possibilities for our democracy is. If we build this, the court will come to this. <laughs> Regardless of the text of the Constitution and despite the character of who they are.
And one final word before I stop. You know, so this book says there's a fidelity to meaning and fidelity to role. And that that fidelity together reveals a role for us in this democracy. A role in constitutional law for us in this democracy. Now, it's a hard time to have that hope especially for those of us over the age of 50, those of us over the age of 50 who are constantly waiting for Superman. Because we come from the 20th century, and the 20th century was defined by heroes. People like King or Kennedy or Malcolm X or FDR or Johnson or Reagan or for some people Trump. And then the anti-heroes, people like Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, single people who stepped on the political stage and had massive effect, changing everything at once. We expect that's how change happens, and we look for that. But the 21st century is filled with people who don't think like that. People who come from the 21st century don't imagine the heroes. And it's easier for them to accept that if there is this reform, it won't be because of one, even Mayor Pete, can't achieve this. It won't be because of five. It won't be five Supreme Court justices who give us democracy back. It must be all of us who exercise through what we understand the world should be a demand for this democracy again. Because if we can change what's obvious, that's a constraint. And that constraint will change what's real. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I apologize, the first time I ever gave this talk, and it's longer than I expected it to be, so I, you know, bored you, I'm sure, for a bit, but I'm eager, you know, to get questions. So there's two microphones here, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, thank you. I'd like to ask, is corporate funding of political interests a proper form or expression of meaning and the role of free speech? Great question. So. I think there's two halves to that. I have to think about the effect of money on the politicians and the effect of money on the public. And what I'm obsessed with is the way the money corrupts the politicians. So if you're raising money, spending 30 to 70% of your time sucking up to super rich people to get the money you need for your campaign, you can't help but be affected by what they want. Just like in the white primary, if you have to suck up to white people to get nominated to run, you can't help but be affected by what whites want as opposed to the rest of the public. That's the corruption we have to worry about. And that's the sort of corruption that's addressed by things like the Seattle Voucher Program, because if you're not getting money from the rich people, but you're getting money from everybody, you can begin to think about everybody. That concern is different, it seems to me, from the concern about whether if somebody spends money and buys an ad in a newspaper or buys a television ad, we the people have been corrupted. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't. But I think when ACLU says there's a danger in regulating political speech, I'm more sympathetic in the second category than in the first. I think the Constitution should say nothing about restricting the ability of Congress to make sure that candidates are dependent on everybody, not just the rich. And the voucher program does that, and I think it should be plainly constitutional, even to the Supreme Court. So. To what extent are we limited by the anti-democratic structures in the Constitution? For example, uh, if we're in order to attain direct election or a working multi-party system, um, we need to get rid of or extreme, or at least modify the Electoral College or have a court that would not immediately rule against the, the movement by states to vote their electors based on, on the national popular vote. Um, 
But in order for the Electoral College to be abolished, we have to have at least one of the 13 smallest states vote against its own interests, or at least it, its own interests as a state, not necessarily as an electorate. And how do we, how do we break through that? Yeah, so it is the case that we have one of the most unamendable constitutions of any in the world. And that's a disaster for constitutional democracy. And the biggest reason it's a disaster is it leads people to become elite constitutionalists. So I was talking to a very good friend, I'm not gonna out him, but um, a, a liberal icon, somebody who I love in a thousand contexts, um, trying to convince him that he ought to be more open to the idea of an Article V convention to get amendments to the Constitution. And he's like, I get your arguments. It just, I don't know why we should risk it with the people. Like, we're going to get, this was before the election, three justices appointed by Hillary Clinton, and they'll fix all the problems in the Supreme Court. This is elite constitutionalism. And I think the first step has got to be a way for us to embrace the idea that that is unjustified constitutionalism. If we can't have a constitution the people themselves embrace, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve that constitution. And the only way to get to that is to have it closer to the people, and that means not easy opportunity to amend, but at least possible, possibility of amending, and we don't have that now. So I, I think that is a critical change we have to make, and, we, and there are people are talking about how to make it. But what I was trying to argue here is that even before we amend it, if all of us come to view, as we are increasingly coming to view, the current system as corrupt, and all of us come to believe that we don't actually have a democracy that is fairly representing people, that itself will change the Constitution. This is this common law or populist conception that I think we don't appreciate enough, and that move we can make without getting three-fourths of the states to and, and so people will act against what's apparently their state's interest in order to, to Look, further democracy. people act against what they think is in their interest for principled reasons all the time. You know, a lot of us on the left like to mock people on the right, like from, like from uh, Kansas. And we say, you know, you support abolishing the so-called death tax. You're never gonna ever earn enough money to have to be affected by the death tax. Why would you ever vote against your own interests like that? And the answer to that is, they're not thinking about it on self-interested basis. They're thinking about it according to their own conception of principle. Mm -hmm. And their conception of principle is that you shouldn't be taxed in that context. Even though they're never going to benefit, they don't believe you should be. And, and so I think that acting on the basis of principle is something we are all able to do as citizens. And that what's so exciting about these state movements is that they've found a way to bring people into a room where they say, okay, take your Republican hat off. Take your Democratic hat off. Katie Fahey, the millennial who started the Michigan redistricting, uh, anti-gerrymandering movement with a Facebook paste, post, um, which turned into 4,000 volunteers collecting 400,000 signatures to get that passed, said that she had a absolute rule. No one was ever allowed to utter partisan words in their meetings. And if they did, they were kicked out. And I think it's amazing. People feel liberated. <laughs> wow. I don't have to hate you, I can just work with you as, as an American, and I think that's the energy that we should be able to deploy, and we could deploy it for constitutional ends if we could just escape the dark lord and all of his force in, in the Senate. Hi, uh, I'm a big fan of one of your first books, Code 2.0, where you talk about the four modalities, commerce, um, architecture to control, software, government, and uh, social? Norms. Social yep. norms, thank yep. you. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is as uh, we're watching social media, uh, you got the deep fakes going on. How do we translate uh, the value of freedom of speech into the digital era? Yeah, that's a really hard problem. And I just finished the book all about it. And it's not this book, it's the next one. But here's the, intu here's the intuition, the slow food movement. So I'm sure this is Seattle, you all know about the slow food movement, right? So what we know is that if you just cook your food and sit down with people to eat it together, you will eat healthy. It's hard to create 
unhealthy food if you cook it yourself. It's just because, you know, processed food has special magic that you don't have in your own kitchen. So if you try to do the same thing, it just, you know, buffalo wings in your own kitchen is terrible. <laughs> so you cook healthy food, and if you just spend an hour or two with your friends and no cell phones talking and eating, you will eat healthy. That's the same idea with democracy. We need a slow democracy movement. And that means we shift democratic speech into places where it has space to think. So podcasts are an amazing resource here. You know, you've got podcasts where people are spending an hour or two hours talking about an idea. And people listen to them as they, as they, uh, as they commute. The number of people listening to them is unbelievable. A a Andrew Yang, who's, you know, doing very, within the top eight of the Democrats, launched his campaign in podcast platforms because no cable news media would cover him. So he started doing podcast platform, including Joe Rogan, which has you know, many tens of millions of, uh, of views eventually. Um, and he could give his speech and his ideas in a context where people could have time to listen to them. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to find ways to discipline ourselves to more of um, uh, slow democracy-like engagements, whether that's podcasting or lectures or whatever it is, and less Facebook and Twitter and all the things that rile us up for all the wrong reasons. And, and that might be the most we can do. Um, you speak about how the Supreme Court is influenced by public opinion and movements, but I'm wondering what you think about what's going on now with the other federal courts as Trump and the Republicans are stacking the other aspects of the federal court with people who do not seem to have, I mean, the institutional understanding or the, the background. I mean, I may disagree with Gorsuch or Kennedy, but they're, they're qualified people where these people on the federal courts that are being do not appear to have that background and I'm wondering, will they have the same fidelity to as public opinion and democracy starts to shift or if these movements can happen, will they be shut down now as the federal courts at the lower levels are stacked with people that are coming straight from the Federalist Society and stuff? Well, again, I, I, mean, I thought your question was careful until that very last line. Sure. <laughs> because, um, you know, there are many people in the Federalist Society who yeah, are I know. very qu highly qualified, yeah. smart. But I completely no, agree I with your criticism. No, I understand what you mean by that, because yeah. I know that. The, yeah. the team. I completely agree with your criticism. Yeah. And, you know, so my wife is German. And her parents, you know, were children during the war, but her grandparents, you know, her grandfather uh, fought in the war uh, for Germany. <laughs> and one of the most interesting parts of the dynamic of living in a, in a family that's German is like watching the discussion about responsibility for failing to step up and do something. So, of course, Hitler is a criminal, and there's no doubt that he's evil in what he did, but the most important evil people in Germany weren't Hitler. They were the people around Hitler that let Hitler become who Hitler became. And, of course, a lot of those people actually supported Hitler. They didn't know better, but a lot of people knew better, and they did nothing about it. Of course, what we're going through right now is not anywhere in the same order of magnitude, but it's the same dynamic. And there are a lot of people who ought to be saying no, who are not, especially when it comes to the judiciary. The process for selecting judges that's going on right now in Washington is the worst it has been in 150 years. 150 years ago, nobody really cared, and they just appointed whoever they want, but but it has completely given up a commitment to not partisan balance. I'm not talking about balance. I'm talking about the integrity that you were talking about. And it's done it for partisan reasons. And again, I, don't mean to, I do mean to pick on him. It's the Dark Lord who is most responsible for this problem. Because he made a, de a deal with the devil. In exchange for getting his judges, he would go along. I, and, you know, I, this is the thing my children will be talking about and your children will be talking all of our children will be talking about for the next generation. Like, who were those people who didn't stand up, who could have stood up? You know, there are lots of great Republicans who have stood up. You know, not enough, but lots of great people who have stood up. Not enough in this space. 
So I completely agree with you. It scares me, which is why I began this talk by saying one of the things I'm most concerned about in this book is that it's a quaint story about the America that was. But 10 years from now, I'm not sure we recognize the same judiciary. I, I'm optimistic, but I see all the reason in the world to be pessimistic for exactly this reason. You know, when you have a person who denies a president the appointment of a Supreme Court justice, a president who was elected by a majority and by the Electoral College, when he's denied an appointment to the Supreme Court in the last year of office because of some rule that says in the last year of office you can't make an appointment to the Supreme Court, when that man who announces that rule and enforces it against that president goes on television to say, oh, if it happened again, yeah, yeah, the rule's off. If a justice dies in February of 2020, the Dark Lord says he will get a Trump nominee on the Supreme Court bench. When a man is so willing to be so inconsistent, so openly unprincipled, he should not be holding the keys to the judiciary, yet he does. And I agree with you, it is a terrible, terrible problem that we don't have enough people resisting right now. Uh, good evening. So it looks like we have three questions, one, two, and then one more over here, and I'm gonna call it at that. Okay. So I appreciate your comments, and I very much share your hope in a populist-driven reclamation of democracy. Um, but my question is, I'm, I wonder whether there's a full appreciation for the power of sort of macro-structural factors that I would argue against, militates against the su likely success of this. And there's many, I'll just list four, as corporations get larger and larger, their relative power to the, to the political system, of course, increases, uh, increasing the likelihood of corruption. A political party that's dedicated to a fossil fuel strategy in the age of peak concern about climate change increases the uh, pressure to corrupt the political system. The decline of the liberal international order uh, in favor of a nationalistic, which has ethnic favoritism implications, creates incentives to corrupt the political system. Some might argue China's demonstration that you can achieve political growth um, without democratic reform. So, so my question is, will these and some other combinations of macro structural forces um, render possibly a, a sort of populist driven effort to reclaim democracy sort of futile because they're outmatched in terms of relative power, so. Probably. <laughs> but I don't give a damn. I, I mean, I take your question as a good one. I think it is absolutely right to fear that maybe we've gone too far. Maybe it's just too late, right? I mean, you, you think about what's going on in the tech industry right now. You know, the last major antitrust enforcement action was felt by this region 20 years ago in the context of the Microsoft case. For 20 years, there's been no meaningful antitrust enforcement action in the tech industry. And the industry has consolidated in a really dramatic way. So 20 years ago, when Microsoft was being prosecuted by the government, it tried to rally the public to its side, but what could it do, right? How much rallying could it deploy? I mean, it had an operating system, and it had an office suite on top, but it didn't, like, broadcast messages to you every time you engaged with it on some political matter. So it was relatively disabled, and when the government decided it was going to prosecute Microsoft, it could barrel down and just prosecute. Now, whether you like that prosecution or not, what I want you to recognize is it was possible. I don't know if it's possible to prosecute these tech giants. I don't know if it's politically possible. Because you imagine if the federal government goes after Facebook. Facebook is wired into the lives of practically every engaged political person in America. Well, not me either, but I mean, most of them. But the point is that they then have this platform that they can deploy for political purposes to resist the government's prosecution. And you tell me what Congress is going to do. 
if 10 million or 20 million Americans start saying, stop breaking my internet, and that political pressure gets deployed against the Justice Department, and the Justice Department has no basis on which to continue its... So that's a great example of maybe we've let it go too far. But, you know, I come back to a story I told here in 2011 about a speech I gave in Dartmouth. At the end of the speech, a woman stood up and she said, Professor Lessig, you've convinced me. It's hopeless, and there's nothing we can do. <laughs> and as I said back here in 2011, when she said that, I had in the back of my mind this image, for some reason, I haven't asked my shrink yet why this is true, I had this image of my then six-year-old boy, and I thought, what if somebody said to me, your, your son has brain cancer and there's nothing you can do? Would I do nothing? Would just give up? And of course, the answer is no, I would do absolutely everything. Odds be damned, because that's what love is. Love says the odds are irrelevant. Now, you know we love this country. All its sins and omissions and harm that it's caused notwithstanding, we love this country. So you might convince me of the odds. You haven't convinced me of what I should do. What I should do, what all of you should do, is fight like hell to wrest back the promise that we were taught we had as Americans. Dr. Lessig, that's the perfect segue to my question. What advice do you have for those of us here in Washington who are fighting hard to bring ranked choice voting to our state? Oh, thank you. This is my last note on here. So Fair Vote Washington is one of my hero organizations in this movement. So Fair Vote um, is pushing in Washington state right now a ranked choice voting system. I just published an op-ed which tries to make this in a typically dramatic way. Um, you know, there's a good argument that the Civil War was caused. <laughs> by the failure to count votes in a ranked choice way. And there's an election between um, uh, Polk and Clay. Polk becomes president. Polk is a deep believer in slavery. He's a deep believer in manifest destiny. He believes we should go to war with Mexico to steal Texas from Mexico. Clay is a soft abolitionist. He believes if you just draw, a, build a fence around um, the South, around slavery, it will die a natural death. That's the same thing Lincoln believed. Going to New York, in New York election, there's a third party candidate who's an extreme abolitionist, you know, a great man, Bierney, who wants to immediately abolish slavery. And there are 15,000 people who vote for Bierney instead of for Clay. But Polk wins New York by just 5,000 votes. If those votes, the second choice of those votes, had gone for their second choice candidate, Clay would have won, Polk and Manifest Destiny would not have won, and who knows whether we have had to fight the most bloody war in the history of America to end slavery. Same thing in 2000. You know, Bush won Florida by 530. 34 votes. 96,000 people voted for Ralph Nader. You can't tell me that if those people could express their second choice vote, a clear majority wouldn't have said Gore over Bush. But the consequence of that is the most tragic foreign affairs mistake in the history of America, which still will cost generations of Americans because of the consequence of that. There's no reason for these mistakes. Maine has shown us how you can apply a ranked choice voting system and give everybody the choice to say, here's my first choice, here's my second choice, here's my third choice. And if your first choice doesn't win, then we'll count your second choice votes. If your second choice votes doesn't win, we'll count your third choice votes. But the result of that is the person who wins is a person who the majority of the district actually likes. And it's not a strange idea for a democracy that the winner should be a person the majority is actually okay with. <laughs> 
Yet we don't have that system because of the electoral college and because of the way we produce presidents in America. And we could. So if Maine, Maine is considering extending it to the presidency, I think that could start, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. That could start a trend <laughs> that could spread. But if Maine does it and Washington does it, then I think we could begin to really focus down on it. Um, now, you know, the election geeks will tell you that there's actually better ways negative voting, or um, there's these wonderful star voting systems, which is a combination. And my view is we ought to be trying all of it. I'm not against any of those alternatives. They're all great alternatives. But rank choice is the alternative that a significant number of nations around the world use to find a majority candidate in their uh, elections, and we ought to be using it too, and there's no good reason not to use it, especially coming into an election where Another local person was at least threatening until recently that he might throw the election for Donald Trump. Those weren't his words, but, um, but that was the risk. And it would be eliminated if there were ranked choice voting. So yes, absolutely. Thank you, Fair Vote Washington, and please support their work if you, if you can. I was very interested in your concept of fidelity to rule and that the, your actions or inactions in some sense need to be looked at in the prospect of what it does to the role of your institution in, in popular society. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to ask your opinion of the position. That, uh, <clears throat> so Robert Mueller said that it is, it is not my role to indict the president, I will hand, I will give you the, day, the information, the evidence, and hand that over to Congress and the position that both Mueller and Congress find themselves in. So there's a really dark story here about the evolution of um, president law. So we all have this intuition that the president is not above the law. And we have that intuition because Nixon famously asserted that the president was above the law. And when he asserted it was above the law, I mean, he, in, in his, his interviews after he was impeached, he said, you know, when the president does it, it is not a violation of the law. People laughed at that idea. And the Nixon prosecution basically affirmed the idea that the president was not above the law and that there was nothing um, in the rule of law that had a special exception for the president. What people don't recognize is that the right-wing legal movement has worked inside of the Justice Department since President Nixon to radically change that idea. And right now, the prevailing rule inside OLC, which is the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the core constitutional hub of the Justice Department, is that laws, even criminal laws, don't apply to the president unless they clearly say they apply to the president, if they, unless they mention they apply to the president, if those laws could conceivably interfere with his presidential powers, his Article II powers. So bribery applies to the president because there's no case in which the president is allowed to engage in bribery. We know that because the Constitution says he can be impeached for bribery. What about murder? Can the president shoot somebody? Fifth On Fifth Avenue? <laughs> Forget what the public would do in reaction? You know, you could say his commander-in-chief power, his war power, might be interfered with if you stopped him from engaging in murder. So unless Congress explicitly says he's subject to the murder regulations, he's not subject to the murder regulations. This is the reality of how the law has been changed. And the second part of that reality is that same OLC has written opinions that says the Justice Department is not allowed to indict the president. Okay, so Robert Mueller is operating under both of those constraints. His job says you can only act in a way that's consistent with the regulations of the Justice Department. So he technically didn't have the power to indict. And he actually went beyond what he should have done to respect this rule about if it could conceivably interfere with uh, his Article II power because 
most of the obstruction cases, charges, under this bizarre rule that has evolved, probably would not be crimes. Now, the hard thing about this is it's hard to build a political movement to change the Office of Legal Counsel's interpretations of the president's power. But that's what's got to happen. Because the reality is the president is above the law. We have built a legal system where the president is plainly above the law. And the consequence of that is exactly the uncertainty that's been created around the current president and the offenses which he's committed. I think that rule is a mistake. I think all of this that has walked us down to this place where it's even arguable that the president is above the law is a mistake. But this is where I'll join the condemnation of the Federalist Society. It has been a well-executed strategy of the Federalist Society for 40 years to make this the law, and they have succeeded. And our side's got to wake up and say, this is not the Constitution the framers gave us. The idea of a president being beyond the power of criminal regulation is bizarre in any modern republic, and we had to change it and go back to principles we all could affirm. So that's a downer to end, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Thank you so much for coming tonight.